Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Thank you all for remaining patient, but I've got some great stories for you. One quick announcement before we jump into today's stories. For those who are new to the channel or listening or you just become a new subscriber, anytime that I put up a video that says remastered in the title, yes, that's going to be an old video that's already on the channel, but I've remastered it to make it sound clearer and better because when I first started Back to Ashes, my equipment wasn't so good, so I've remastered it and it's also used as a fill-in until I actually have my days off of work to record new material for you. So I hope that clears up some confusion. And also, if it does not have the word true in the title, it is a fictional video. If you are new to the channel and you begin to enjoy what you are hearing, please join the family and hit that subscribe button and set that notification bell to all, as we would love to have you. Also, if you have a November birthday, please go visit the community tab on the main page of Back to Ashes. I made a post about it. Please drop your birthday down below. As any birthdays mentioned in a video's comment section will not be used. I like to keep the birthdays over on the community tab in a nice, tidy order. Cool? All right. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Crazy Exes. Right after this intro, an ad will play. I'll read the first story an ad will play, and after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Warning, some of these stories may contain material not suitable for all. Listener discretion is highly advised. This one is complicated. Every ex is an ex for a different reason. None are good. My worst was the most difficult relationship and most painful. And always. He was my first serious boyfriend when I was 17 to 19 years of age. He was mentally and physically abusive. He controlled every aspect of my life. It took a major situation for me to realize something was really wrong. I just accepted that the way he was because he loved me so much. Sarcasm is deep here. I understand fully now. I was so stupid then. This is really odd because I actually had a teeny breakdown two nights ago. I had a nightmare or memory of one time that he choked me until I passed out. That was his thing, choking me or putting a pillow over my face until I passed out. I actually learned a trick after a dozen or so times to quit fighting and pretend to pass out. That worked for a while. Then the punches started, and the pushing and the biting. Then the throwing me. The last time he threw me into the bedside table, and my lower back went into the corner, really fucking hard. I started bleeding like I was on my period all of a sudden. He drove me to the ER and dropped me in the parking lot and left. I had a miscarriage. I didn't know I was pregnant. I went to the police, got a temporary protection order, moved back in with my parents, and have lived with this for 20 years. I'm sorry for the long, drawn-out story, but yes, he was truly the worst. Trying to decide who my worst ex I've ever had. Well, that's a contest between my psycho ex, my awful ex, and my plain old abusive ex. But I think psycho wins. My awful ex was my first husband. He cheated on me and then guilted me into a polyamorous relationship. Then, somehow managed to cheat on that version of the relationship as well. But at least he didn't fight me in the divorce when I finally decided I was done with him. My abusive ex didn't actually get much of a chance to abuse me because that was the second abusive relationship I had been in. He was my rebound after the ex-husband. And 
The minute he started showing his true colors, I noped right the hell out. Unfortunately, I let Psycho move in with me, even though I knew it was a bad idea. Then, he jokingly threatened to strand me in another state. I didn't find it funny and broke up with him. Unfortunately, he refused to move out of my house. Then, my garage door mysteriously stopped working, trapping my car in the garage and almost making me late for work. It mysteriously started working again as soon as I reported it to the police. The joke was on him. I only reported it so that he'd fix it. I was very careful in my report not to make any outright accusations. By this point, I knew all about gaslighting and the abuser playbook. His next move was to come back from morning PT. He was in the army. And park in front of my car, trapping me in the driveway. After about the third time, I called the cops on him. He finally had enough and moved back into the barracks. A week or so later, CID came knocking on my door. They're the army equivalent of NCIS. They wanted to search my house because Psycho had stolen a government hard drive that contained classified information, possibly in an attempt to conceal the fact that he'd downloaded porn onto it at work, and he still had my address listed as his place of residence. When I moved, but still kept my house in the area since I was planning to move back, he texted me on my way to my new location, asking if I could let him into my house since he thought he'd left a necessary uniform item there. I didn't respond. Sometime in the next couple of days, someone broke into my house, turned on the water in the upstairs bathroom, stopped up the emergency drain, and locked the bathroom door behind them, completely destroying the upstairs of the house. They also broke a window to get in, allowing the cat I had left behind to escape. I never saw her again. My new place only allowed two pets. I had a friend looking after the cat and the house until such time as I could find a place that would allow a third pet. He later followed me to a magic tournament in another state. I know he followed me there because he approached me and shoved an envelope into my hands and tried to talk to me. Turned out the envelope had $500, presumably as a half-assed apology for breaking into my house. So yeah, threatening to strand me, stealing classified information, and stalking me definitely takes the wind. Not to mention the things I can't prove, like gaslighting me, trashing my house, and, of course, letting my cat escape. This one is about my first ever boyfriend. I have always been a girl who believed in one life, one love. So, before I got into a relationship, I thought a lot. I waited until I was 18, and I was always fascinated about him being an old schoolboy like me, a bit funny and matching my vibe in the first go. So, I met somebody and fell for him exactly when I was 18, on my birthday. I had spent the evening with him, and within a span of time, I realized I had finally fallen for someone. Days passed by. We started dating, and everything was new to me. I told myself to not be very serious, as I knew the outside world was bad, and people are good at pretending who they aren't. So, I decided to take things slow, but I was madly in love. I couldn't resist but show him how much I loved him. And months after months, I found out that he had been involved with many girls, having casual relationships every random day and shit, which was devastating for me. When I confronted him about it, he was so good at acting like I am delusional, and I was too naive to believe him. One kiss from him and I'd forget things. I was blindly in love. One fine day, almost 11 months into our relationship, 
I found out that he's been dating someone. So this time I decided I'm done and I should move on for good. So I blocked him everywhere and cut ties. After a month or two, he started posting a picture of me and him on his social media. I got a text from a friend to check it and I was kind of flattered. I wished I knew it was a trap. I fell for it and got back with him and things got serious. He told me that now that we're official, we should take things to the next level, which I was not okay with. And he called me over to his friend's place. And yeah, he tried to convince me to sleep with him, to which I kept saying no, but he kept on forcing it on me and undressed me. I tried stopping him as I was not ready, but that didn't stop him. I went numb. And when I finally saw that my virginity was taken away, I started sobbing. He looked me in the eye and said, I will marry you. Do not worry. I am there for you. And I just couldn't say anything. I never wanted to lose my virginity with some random guy. I wanted to wait until marriage or wait for someone who was forever mine. And after this, shit began to go downhill. My friends never liked him because he made me cut them off for some silly behavior. So, my friends had tried to get me back to them, which led to a fight between me and my boyfriend at the same time. So, things got so bad he started to physically abuse me, and I stood there doing nothing because I had given this guy my virginity, and I thought through everything. I will stay because I want to marry him just like one typical Indian wife. I snapped back when I had enough, and he didn't digest the fact that I hit him back. After that day, I realized that I was becoming like him, abusive, toxic, and full of negativity. There were so many things that happened. He had an on and off relationship. He was very possessive of me talking to the opposite gender or even being around them. I was stuck with this dude. I still loved him, and I was ready to do anything just to be with him. Finally, after six plus years, when it was time that we decided if we are going to get married or part our ways, he started behaving differently. He was a Muslim, and I was Catholic. I had done my research if we both could get married, and the answer was always a yes. But... He told me at the last minute that he could not get married until I converted to Muslim, of which I had always made clear that I will not sacrifice my faith. I will respect yours, but you should respect mine too. And he was okay until the final judgment. So, all of this behavior seemed fishy because a few months back, he wanted to marry me, and now suddenly, he wants me to be converted or leave him forever. So I clearly told him, you should do your research on whether I can marry you without being converted. And he was like, until then, we cannot be together. I had no option then to leave him alone. After a while, he joined my company for work, and we again had the same conversation. I asked him if he was sure about me, and he said, no, he's not. So I kept telling him to find the answer, but he kept wasting time and I felt like he's trying to build a relationship with someone before he leaves me forever. But one fine day he came to me and said, We can get married, and you don't have to convert. I was so happy and couldn't stop myself from dreaming of our marriage, but like we know, happiness doesn't last forever. We decided to spend the night together, and I randomly had his phone with me. I never check his phone, but... Something made me do it, and when I checked it, I saw that there was a video of a girl laying on his leg and taking a photo of them. My heart dropped because I thought none of this would happen after the initial dating, and he swore he never spoke to any other girls. When I confronted him, he denied that she was laying on his leg. He literally denied it, and I had lost my shit. I couldn't do anything but cry. He kept telling me it was when he had broken up for a month or so, but still, it mattered to me. 
He tried convincing me to forgive him and ask him for time because I didn't know what to do. I was happy that we finally could get married, but also marrying someone who had secret affairs even after fucking you every random night? So I told him to fuck off and give me my space and if he'll be okay if I did something like that. And blocked him. As I mentioned that he was working in my office. The next afternoon, I randomly go to my office cafeteria and sit alone thinking about the previous night. And when I look around, I see my guy sitting with another girl having lunch. A girl I never saw before. And my hands started to shiver. I just couldn't breathe seeing how normal he was around her. So, when he got up and went out, I gave him a call and asked who he was with. And he denied saying he's outside smoking until I told him that I saw him. He was so casual about this as if it doesn't matter, and he was gaslighting me saying, you wanted to do the same thing with someone, that's why I gave up. And I just felt disgusting on how shameless a person could be. It was a lot for me to digest, but that didn't stop him. I told him to tell me the truth and we could get back to normal, but he just kept lying to me and started to push me away. He knew if I found out the truth, I will leave him forever. So, he kept me in denial. I kept finding out things, one after the other, and I was so vulnerable that I still wanted to be with him, even after all this time. After a few days, we started talking normally. He said he will try to be with me because he doesn't trust me. As I was stupid, I thought all of this was my mistake. So I took the blame as long as it meant having him in my life. So one fine evening, he told me that he's going to play cricket, so he's not sure what time he'll meet me. That felt suspicious. I asked him if he still talks to any other girls, or is he planning to drop any girl off with his vehicle? And he said no. But since I had doubts, I went near my office to find the truth. Then as I knew, he was waiting for a girl. The girl sat behind his vehicle, and they drove off. I had a panic attack seeing that. I tried to follow them, but failed, so I went home to calm myself. Then later, I spoke to him as he was supposed to meet me. I kept asking him if there was any girl that he dropped off somewhere, and he said no. And I had decided that this is it. So I told him what I saw, and he said, Yeah, because I was not sure about you and blah, 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 blah. Narcissistic, gaslighting, manipulative behavior. As always, there were many incidents that followed after this. I'd given up, and I saw him always being the greatest fuckboy that he is flaunting around to other girls around me, and I was not surprised. After a few months of this crazy-ass bullshit, I decided it's time to let it go for good. I calmly told him that I am done and I will be out of his life forever, and I went on a vacation. While I was on that vacation, he contacted me saying that he is having nightmares about me sleeping with other people, but I wasn't. And he kept saying that to me, but I didn't care, because I knew it's one of his games. He texted me saying that once I am back, he wants to talk to me, but I wasn't digging it. I knew he's being rejected somewhere, so he came to me, and I was not flattered by his welcoming behavior. When I came back into town, the same day he asked me to meet him, he showed up near my house, so I had to go. He said he wants me in his life, and all other girls don't compare to me and shit, but I knew it was a trap. He was just horny, and knowing me, the stupid girl I am, I spent the night with him. In between my vacation, I had contacted the girl's boyfriend, the one who was sitting with him for lunch, and asked him if he knows my boyfriend was close to his girlfriend, and that guy had no clue about all of this. So, I was curious on what was the truth, and this time, I wanted it all to be out in the open. So, me and the girl's boyfriend planned on getting my boyfriend and his girlfriend all together, and let them spill the truth. 
So we decided to set this up. I randomly took my guy out at the spot that boy and I decided to meet. So when my guy sensed that I am setting up a meet with that girl's boyfriend, he made me sit on his vehicle and ran off. I confronted him on why he was running off and he admitted that he contacted that girl even after being warned by the boyfriend. So I spoke to the girl and requested her to tell me his truth and wow, the things she told me were unbelievable. It seems like my guy, who is now my ex, portrayed me as a psycho girlfriend who cannot let go of him and I am forcing him to be in the relationship and that he is not interested in me at all. He told his friends that I was fat and ugly and he cannot imagine marrying someone like me and he was never planning on marrying me in the first place. He also told his friends that I slept with my brother and all my sisters are into prostitution and my mom is also characterless and that's the reason he cannot be with me. The girl also told me that he's been in a relationship with a girl named Sakshi for the past few months and kept her a secret so I don't harm her and he wants to move on and have a good relationship with that girl. I had seen the girl Sakshi with him and when I asked who she was he told me her name was Sasha and later he said it was Himani and he doesn't even talk to her so much. The girl also confirmed that he used to take extra work off hours so he could spend time with a girl named Sakshi. So when I heard about all of this, I of course lost my shit. It was the end of it all. I couldn't believe that somebody who claimed to love me and fucked my body for months could talk like that about me just to justify his cheating ass. He put dirt on my name so he doesn't look like the bad guy doing the wrong things. I have failed miserably changing a man and I am traumatized for life. It's been 14 days since things have ended and I have nothing but hatred for him. I will let karma take over. He is not worth a minute more of my time. I wasted enough time behind him, not a minute more. And... That's my story. I finally got the message, but it took a fairly high level of craziness. I was 30 years old, and while I dated a variety of men, the relationships were short-term. Hell, only one of them hit the year anniversary mark. I don't blame the guys for not sticking around. Trial lawyers, particularly associates, have lots of demands on their time and attention. Then, I met a CPA expert witness. It seemed like a good match. He got my schedule and we could talk shop, both like cars and had a lot in common. I missed the signs early on. He was an alcoholic with anger management issues and a hair trigger temper. But I'd never had a real relationship and I thought I was in love. So I hung in there for four years and put up with all manner of bad behavior, including wrecking my classic 68 Corvette, spun out driving drunk and got ran over by an 18-wheeler, not a scratch on the bastard. Then calling me to come deal with the police while he sobered up. Sneaking up and firing a 50 caliber Thunderhawk pistol two inches from my ear at the hunting lease, rupturing my eardrum in the process of this joke. I won't even list anymore. It's an embarrassingly long list of outrageous shit. I learned to walk on eggshells when he was in the bag because you never knew what was going to set him off. He never ever hit me or got physical, but his rages were frightening. He finally went too far after we'd spent the weekend in California. He'd taken me shopping and bought me a couple of outfits. When we left, I packed them and put on my comfy travel clothes, an oversized blazer, t-shirt, and jeans. We took separate flights home. V got shit-faced on the plane and drank more before I made it to the house. The minute I walked in, I could tell he was drunk and royally pissed off about something. 
When I asked what was wrong, he didn't say a word, just stalked over, took my blazer, and went out the back door. What the fuck? He put my coat down on the newly bricked patio, doused it with gasoline, and set it on fire. Well, I probably should have hit the road immediately, but I had to know what my poor camel's hair jacket did to deserve the death penalty. Once it was just a pile of ashes, he came back in and lit into me. About what? Well, I was an ungrateful bitch with no taste who didn't wear the lovely clothes he bought me on the flight home. That was my favorite coat, and this was a bridge too far. It knocked some sense into me. This guy was deranged and dangerous. He had more than a few weapons in the house. Next time he blew a fuse, I might die. Well, I certainly wasn't going to embarrass my parents and make them explain my untimely death with, yes, Rachel's boyfriend shot her. Why? Um, hmm. Seems she folded the towels wrong. Nope, not gonna happen. I recently escaped a two-plus-year relationship with a sociopathic narcissist. She was borderline crazy and got jealous and often violent when she drank, which was often. Some of the things she did to me poured boiling water over my head while I was asleep. I spent six days in the burn unit, ICU. Why I went back to her after a while, I have no idea. I certainly shouldn't have. My entire family and best friend even disowned me as long as I stayed with her. Hit me in the head with a baseball bat while I was sleeping. Five stitches. Managed to get banned from virtually every place I lived in both bars I went to. It only took her 20 minutes at one of them and got me evicted from at least two places with her actions. Took $4,500 out of my bank account while I was in jail, leaving me with $1.35. Don't even ask why I was stupid enough to add her to my account. She called the police at least eight times, claiming I was beating her. I don't beat women, and had never, ever even been accused of it, let alone arrested for it. This had caused me so many problems that I am still dealing with, including three months in jail. This occurred after I had given her $1,000 to rent an apartment, telling her I would need to stay there for a few days until a big check I was expecting came in. She told me I had to leave at 2 a.m. a couple of nights later, and as I was leaving as requested, she called the police and complained that I was harassing her. This, combined with a statement and complaint she had made when she had gone to the hospital several months earlier to detox, something she did six or so times during our relationship, that accused me of in great detail of beating her and sending her to the hospital, landed me in jail. This is where I finally decided enough is enough and disappeared from her life when I was released. She had emptied my bank account, so no bill money for me, as it was $2,500. I would never see that again. I ended up pleading to a misdemeanor and waited for sentencing to get out. I wrote a letter to the judge with her written statement and multiple documents, letter from the cabbie who picked her up, hospital intake record with the time, various police statements, etc., showing that her written statements were completely false, literally from the opening sentence. I think the judge was the only one that believed me as she had me released ASAP and dropped all other charges and punishment, except for a short term of probation required by law in this state. Unfortunately, I now have several permanent blots on an otherwise clean record with the added stigma of a DB conviction. She no longer knows my new phone number or where I currently live. I saw her once recently in the library when she sent someone over to tell me she wanted to talk to me, 
and, when I saw her, I picked up and left. The cabbie is the mutual friend of ours, and told me she has been going off the deep end with her drinking, to the point of several recent evictions, but I won't save her anymore. I guess God only gives you experiences that you can survive and learn from. This was certainly one of them. That's my story, and I'm glad it's over. Okay, enough whining. I'm going to go back to my Android programming. Oh, 2018 update. So I saw her twice this year, and both times ended up with me in jail, when I would not let her stay with me, and she took $2,000 in cash, a $500 Mermot down, Gore-Tex parka, my keys, and my phone. She showed up at my door the first time, I think it was around January 17th at 3.30 a.m., with the shit beat out of her by her new man. I am very empathetic and let her in while I try to call the police to come take her to the hospital. She grabbed my phone away and eventually called them herself, and they arrested me and made me leave my door open so she could stay in my apartment. The next time, a few weeks later, she didn't even bother trying to ask me to stay over. A cop just showed up at my door. I had not seen her since the January incident. She had three cop cars in the parking lot, and as I was being taken out in handcuffs, I watched her demonstrate to them how she had to run out the back door to get away from me as I was beating her. Again, they made me leave my door open for her. Life is crazy, or else it's just me. Last time I saw her, she was yelling at me from across the street. I just ignored her, as I tried to do long, long, long ago. My ex-girlfriend accused my best friend of sexual assault, then tried to make me choose between her and him. In the long list of crazy shit she did during our relationship, this has to be the gold medal position. Buckle in, kids. It's about to get crazy up in here. We were at a library helping blind kids to read Braille. Not really. We were at the pub, and there wasn't a blind kid in sight. For all of you pun lovers out there, you're so very welcome. My then-girlfriend had come up to my hometown to see the sights. Then, realizing quite quickly that there were none, we started to drink, hence the pub. Joined by a handful of my mates, it was a lovely little gathering with more than a few laughs and stories going around the table, which was good. See, introducing a new partner to an established circle of friends can be confronting. But she was a bigger hit than a new cellmate in a shower block D, so everything seemed great. And by the time the night ended, she and I went home with smiles on our faces, looking back on the night well enjoyed. Of course, we did stop smiling, almost immediately. That was always the way with us. Because while we had our moments of bliss, we had an equal number of fire and brimstone. And... I never knew when these moments would arrive. At least if you're being shot at through the trees, you know where to aim your defenses. It's when the jungle falls quiet, you should be terrified, not knowing when or where the next attack will occur. And so I often quietly tiptoed around the jungle of our relationship, hoping not to step on a mine or get mauled by a tiger. And still, just as I felt safe and secure, Boom. I was dragged into quicksand. You're catching up with your friends again? That's really disrespectful. That was a common catchphrase. That's really disrespectful. I'd spent the better part of the week staying at her house. She lived 30 minutes or so away by train. So by the time the weekend rolled around, a little time with the boys felt exciting. Now, I'll admit, I'm a big believer that the space you ask for in a relationship is returned tenfold when you come back to your partner feeling energized and romantic. So a little time away actually leads to a closer relationship together. But she didn't see it that way. She saw it as disrespectful. 
Whether I was spending too much time with the boys or whether my night out was justified, I'm not sure. But I am sure of what happened next. I can't believe you want to spend time with them, especially after what happened last week, she said. Now, that's a teaser of a sentence. It's the clickbait of the relationship world. You think you can walk away after that line? <laughs> Good luck. So I took the bait. What happened last week? I replied cautiously, knowing full well to think through my words like a bomb disposal expert picking at live wires in a field. I didn't want to say anything, she went on. But your friend Adrian followed me into the bathroom at the pub last week. I listened intently. He came into the women's bathroom and held me against the wall. He said, you look amazing tonight. He put his hand under my dress. Now, I'm not often short for words. In fact, I know heaps of them, over 200 to be exact, but I was floored at this news. I didn't know what to say, so I went into protective boyfriend mode with all stations on high cuddle alert. I canceled my plan with the boys and shut off my phone, spending the entire weekend with her instead. The next week, back at home, I hit up my mate. No word of a lie. It was the single most uncomfortable conversation I've had since a cleaner asked me why I'd been in the hospital for so long. Mate, I've got advanced leukemia. Can you just please mop the floor and go away? I was straight up with my friend, though, because I didn't know how else to approach it. I don't know how to say this, so I'll just say it. My girlfriend says you touched her inappropriately at the pub last week. So, I need to know what happened. Right now. You could have heard a pen drop, followed by someone with very nimble fingers whispering, Sorry, I dropped my pen. Followed by the aforementioned pen being placed back in a pen pouch. That's how quiet it was between us. My mate looked at me and placed his head in his hands with disbelief, firmly denying anything had happened at all. Her irresistible claim against his immovable defense. Fuck. So you're all here for a chuckle. So I won't go into the days and weeks of back and forth that followed that conversation, but it turned out to be 100% a lie. My girlfriend had created a divide between her and the rest of my circle of friends that, to be honest, would never truly heal between us all. We all tried our best to move past that moment, and to give some closure to you all, she admitted the accusation of inappropriate touching was a lie, fueled by anger at me spending time away from her. But it was an uneasy truce, to be honest. In targeting a friend of close to 20 years and accusing him of a form of sexual assault, she had well and truly drawn a line in the sand. Those words, even said in anger, carry a hell of a lot of power. Maybe more so in 2019's social climate. In the distressing, emotional, draining weeks that followed her lie, she'd thrown an ultimatum into the universe, an unspoken, it's either me or him. She would take back those words when the truth eventually came out. But this far as batshit crazy goes, that right there was the craziest fucking thing my ex ever did to me, and even worse, to my mate. I met this guy when I was 22. He was in his early 30s, and he was sarcastic, and I thought he was so smart and educated. After several months of just catching up and fooling around, he one night gave me some ecstasy tablets and while high, I said I loved him. You know, because when you're high, eh, you love everyone. He got me to say it again the next day after I came down, and that's where his behavior changed. Soon as we started dating, multiple messages and phone calls daily, I couldn't get a moment of peace. A couple of months later, we separated, but on good terms, to the point that I got into a bind and 
he let me move into his house. Well, this place was a massive trash pile, and as I wasn't working at the time, I took it upon myself to clean it. Was finding used syringes and used condoms all over the place. Yay, much fun to be had there. I ended up getting a job and made friends with my co-workers, all straight males. Naturally, working in hospitality led us to go for drinks quite a lot, which led to being questioned on a regular basis. Are you sure they're straight? You seem to be spending a lot of time with them. Came to a head one night when I flipped and decided to leave while I was on the back balcony. The only way out from there is through the door and out through the front of the house, which is where he stood, blocking my path. I spent about several minutes asking him to get out of the way so I could leave, and he refused. So I ended up rushing him and pinning him against the wall, telling him in no uncertain words that I said I was leaving, never to block my way, etc., before I let him go and left. After a couple of weeks, he contacted me again, asked me to meet for coffee and mentioned that the rent I had been paying him. He had kept it all aside for me to move back south, as he knew that I was neither happy there or any good with saving money. He wanted to meet for coffee and give me the money so I could leave the state, which was cool. Several months later, after moving around a bit and changing my phone number, which he managed to get a hold of every single time, there was a knock at the door of the house I was living in at the time. This guy had driven well over 1,000 kilometers after overhearing the name of my street during a phone call and basically knocked on every door on the street just to find me. He ended up waiting outside of my work that night and convinced me to stay in a twin motel room with him. Not long after, I relocated and changed my number yet again. He got my number yet again. I got a job and moved again. He found me again. But this is where it got worse. About two years after, I had left the state that he lived in. He and a friend were beaten at some lockout park or something, 1,800 kilometers away from where I was living and working. And somehow, he came to the conclusion that I had set it up. From that point forward, he orchestrated my job loss had fake warrants released for me in a state. By this point, he was sleeping with a police officer and was continually sending abusive messages, which stopped after I agreed to accept a restraining order. After the magistrate of this hearing demanded to know why I had been locked in a cell, even though there had been no charges made against me, the warrants were brought up, to which the magistrate replied, why are there warrants without charges being laid? That gave me two years of peace, but as soon as the order ran out, he started abusing me again, ridiculing me, telling me how everyone hates me and I should just kill myself. So I took a restraining order out on him. Again, I was blessed with two years of peace, and again, he started as soon as it ran out. So I took out another order, same process, the abuse started after the two years were up. This time, however, the magistrate paid more attention. He was astounded by how long this had gone on, by how long I had been dealing with photos of me, along with my details spread around with lies and abuse, how I had actually been beaten up thanks to one of his friends arranging it. Again, I was interstate to the point that the magistrate, word for word, asked me, how the fuck are you still sane? This magistrate changed my life. He listened to me. He made the order so that the guy had to remove every article he had ever posted about me from social media, and he made the restraining order permanent. After eight long years, I was finally free. Sadly, as a result of those eight years, I now have extreme social anxiety and honestly have no idea how to make new friends. So yeah, cheers to that.
Here's a woozy one for you. My ex bludgeoned me with a wooden bat, attempted to relieve me of my life by gnawing a path through my arteries and my forearm before attempting to have me incarcerated for sexual assault and battery. You heard that right. She beat me with a bat, tried to slit my freaking wrists with her teeth, and then tried to accuse me of the R word. I won't claim she was insane. I'm not a doctor, that's why. And I can't claim that I wasn't partly to blame. I was. But the whole shtick about who did what is a story for another day. On this particular day, she came home and attempted to seduce me. The only problem was, I was in the process of moving out because, you know, breakup. When she realized I wasn't going to put out, she lost her ever-living freaking mind. She went downstairs and retrieved a huge wooden bat. Not one of those tiny sissy sticks, but a huge, I'm trying to hit a home run with your skull bats. She came back upstairs and took the bat to my stuff. I stood there in shock as she utterly demolished my television, my PS3, and finally my laptop. At this point, she realized that destroying my stuff wasn't going to get a rise out of me. So, she turned the bat on me. She got three or four good hits in before I managed to disarm and push her halfway across the room. She then proceeded to throw insults at me, which I cannot repeat here, but were basically designed to provoke me to attack her. Her verbal diarrhea was what gave me the sneaking suspicion that I was being set up. After five minutes of insults, she realized I wasn't going to do anything. So, she attacked me again with her bare hands. At this point, I'd like to point out she is not that big. While she had a bat, she was able to do more major damage, but with only her hands, it's like being attacked by an angry kitten. While the blows themselves weren't painful, her nails were beginning to draw blood. I restrained her, and as gently as I could, with her kicking and screaming, carried her outside the room, tossed her into the hallway, then closed and locked the door behind me. She went downstairs, came back, and broke one of my favorite knives whilst trying to carve open the door. I called the police, who arrived 15 minutes later, all the while she was banging on the door, daring me to come out so she can kill me. With the cops outside, the house and her yelling at them to go away at the front door, I made a run for the back door. She saw me and intercepted me, attempting to stop me from opening the door. But then again, she's not that big. I restrained her with one hand. That was a mistake. As I was trying to open the door, she twisted over and sunk her teeth into my left wrist and began to grind her fangs, attempting to claim her pound of flesh. Great Scott, that was painful. I finally managed to open the door. The cops came rushing in and had to pull her off my wrist like she was a rabid Rottweiler. She finally calmed down and I was able to grab my stuff sands my good knife and leave with the cops watching to make sure nothing else happened. I declined to press charges because, again, I wasn't entirely innocent in the run-up to this event. I found out a few days later that she had told people that I sexually assaulted her and beaten her. Her plan had been to get laid, provoke me into laying hands on her, and then get me locked up. Yeah, fun times. This one is a roller coaster, or at least it was for me at the time. I had an ex dump me out of the blue for no reason at all. Within four hours, she changed her mind and wanted me back. I was fair and said I wanted some time to think, and a week later met her and said it was time to move on. There were tears on her behalf, but we agreed to be friends and I thought everything was okay. Boy, was I wrong. 
She got all of her family to message me on Facebook, abusing and threatening me because I broke her heart, even though she did the dumping, remember? I simply blocked them all and settled for the evening. The next morning, I wake up to a text saying she was going to kill herself and had already overdosed and slit her wrists. I immediately called her phone, but it was off. I went into an absolute frenzy of panic and phoned my older sister, who was at work, to come get me and drive me to my ex's house. We get there and are both pounding on the door, my heart racing with fear and dread. After about five minutes, she opens the door. Three tiny scratches on her wrist and she had taken three painkillers to overdose. Needless to say, we were fuming. Oh, but it doesn't end there. A few months down the line, her auntie messaged me on Facebook and says she's in a lot of trouble and needs help, and asked if I wouldn't mind speaking to her. I now think this was my ex using the account to get my attention. Anyways, I unblock her and ask what's up, and she tells me she's been sexually assaulted. So I was mortified and asked what happened. Here are the chain of events that were written in return. She speaks to random fella and agrees to meet. They get into his car together. They start kissing and touching each other. She gives him a condom and they have sex. Needless to say, I blocked her immediately after hearing such nonsense. I also then found out that after she threatened to kill herself, she went and slept with my sister's boyfriend at the time. So all I really have to say after this is good riddance. And that, dear listeners, does bring a close to these true crazy exes stories. Before I go any further, I would like to take a moment and acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Patty's niece, Chrissy Elias, Anita V, Donna, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S, Tina Mead, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. Again, I can't thank you all enough for remaining the pillars of which Back to Ashes stands upon. I appreciate you more than I can put into words. To these subscribers and the first time listeners or anyone just peeking in just to check the channel out, thank you as well for your support. For without you, there would not be a me and there would also not be a Back to Ashes channel. Thank you for your ongoing support. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. Have yourselves a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.